All right, so thanks to everybody who came uh, to this last lecture. So l let me uh, remind you where we stopped last time, and uh, I'll try to also get to what we'll try to do today. So we defined a uh, Ziegel transform, so we had the function f from rd to c, and uh, the Ziegel transform took a function like this, and it moved it to a function on the moduli space of lattices, so g mod gamma, <coughs> the moduli sp space of unimodular lattices in Rd. Unimodular meaning that, oops, that they have co-volume co one, so lattices, so I'll call a lattice delta. And so what, what were the Ziegel transforms? So there are several different flavors. They're essentially equivalent, and if you can prove something about one, you can prove something about all the, the other ones. But the relationship between them uh, is going to be useful, and so it's good to have names for all of them. So the main one was, so the full transform, if you give it a lattice, it just sums the function at all the vectors in the lattice, including the zero vector. Then we had the reduced one, where we summed over the same collection of vectors, except for the zero vector. So all lattices have the zero vector, so we can just forget about it. And finally, we had the primitive version, where we summed only over the primitive vectors. Primitive, oops, f of v. So remember, primitive meant that no other multiple of the vector, except maybe minus the vector, had, it was in the lattice. No other smaller, shorter vector proportional, but a uh, smaller vector was in the lattice. OK, so uh, there are two properties. So l l let's uh, write like this. So the, the Ziegel transform was any of these three. Essentially, it took functions, let's say compactly supported functions on RD, and it mapped them to continuous functions on g mod gamma. And if we took the reduced Ziegel transform, it went from, it, it preserved up to some uh, scalar multiple. So uh, here we have Lebesgue measure 2L1 of g mod gamma with har measure. So, uh, it was a bounded function uh, in this sense. And the, the other important fact was that we had an action, so both on Rd and on G mod gamma, we had an action on both of these spaces by G, which I remind you is SLDR, and this transform was equivariant. So we could act on a function here and then move it by the Ziegel transform, and it would be the same as just moving it by the Ziegel transform and then acting on this side. So this, we had this equivariance property, which was important. And we said that uh, we can also consider the action on measures. So a measure is something dual to a continuous function. If you have a continuous function, and if you have a measure, it gives a number to every continuous function by integration. So since they're duals, the measures are going to go the other way. So if you have a measure here, you can produce a measure on RD, so action on measures. So, the, so if mu was, let's say, finite, or, re, well, l let me say just reasonable, because finite is not enough, measure on G mod gamma, then we define the new measure is a measure on, oops, on Rd by the following formula. We said that, so a measure has to take a function from Rd and give you a number, so it takes the function and it first moves the function by the Ziegel transform and then applies the measure on the other side. So again, this is, so we got this transpose maps from 
measures on, so reasonable measures on G mod gamma to reasonable measures on RD. And so the reason why I'm being vague about what's reasonable is because we're only going to, going to be interested in uh, a particular measure on the left side. So on the left side, you have a very natural measure given by a uh, Haar measure. So, uh, so what we have, is, so we're interested in the Haar measure uh, on the side. Where does it move over here? And so we said that, uh, so we know it is SLDR invariant. Because it's a SLDR invariant on this side, so it will be, when you move it, and this preserves the SLDR action, it will be SLDR invariant on the other side. So we would like to understand what is, uh, what is it. And on the other side, there are only two SLDR invariant measures. So it is going to be either the, uh, it should be some linear combination of, har uh, of the Dirac delta mass at zero and Lebesgue measure. So what we would like to understand is, first of all, what, what are these numbers? What are these coefficients? And uh, yeah, so, okay. So the, the first fact is that, so, and you can ask the same question for any of these three transforms. You can ask where does each of these transforms take uh, higher measure, and there should be some v relatively simple relationships. So the reason why the full Ziegel transform is useful, so I mean, just note this, what I said. So same question for the primitive and the reduced Ziegel transforms. Where, does, where do they take uh, Lebesgue me uh, higher measure on the left side? And so the first claim is that uh, if you take the full Ziegel transform of the Haar measure, then it's going to be the same linear combination of uh, delta mass and uh, Lebesgue measure. So the, in other words, if you use the full uh, Ziegel transform, then you get uh, everything, uh, th then you get the same number on both sides, so you have the symmetry. So why, why is this so? So the proof, so remember we had the Poisson summation formula which uh, went like this. Let me write this here. So it said that if you take the sum, so this is true for any, again, let's say compactly supported function. If you sample it over all vectors of a lattice, it's the same as sampling the Fourier transform over the vectors of the dual lattice. And uh, the Haar measure on G mod gamma is invariant by this involution. Delta goes to the dual lattice, uh, delta dual. And so this means that uh, Haar measure, for example, is preserved by this involution, but on the RD side, so if you look on RD, uh, Fourier transform, so Fourier transform of the Dirac delta mass is Lebesgue measure and the other way around. If you take your Fourier transform of Lebesgue, you get uh, the delta mass. So, uh, so this means, so uh, you, you get that whatever this, the Fourier transform of Haar measure is, is, it is invariant by Fourier transform. And since you know it's some, some combination of these two guys, these two guys have to have the same coefficient. Okay? So uh, at least we know that it's just really one number that we care about. So the other claim, the, the other two claims which are easy to check, but uh, would require a little bit more time, so I'm, I'm not going to, to do it, but uh, at least morally it should be quite obvious, is that if you take the, uh, let's say, the reduced Ziegel transform. So it really, the reason you get this delta mass at zero is because when you define the Ziegel transform, you're summing over the zero vector. 
So if you don't sum over the zero vector, so if you take, if you transform the higher measure with respect to reduced, uh, so without summing over the zero vectors, then you are just going to get, uh, this is just going to be proportional to Lebesgue. And the same thing for the primitive vectors. Uh, in other words, there is no uh, Dirac delta mass uh, at zero. And the reason, uh, the way you can see this is as follows. So what, what you can do is you can test on some functions, right? So the, the, the reason why we, so, so far we're just doing formal man manipulations, but the reason why these concepts are useful is because you can actually test them on functions. And the function you can test it on is a, a bump function at the origin, very, uh, very small, a, fun a small function continuous of integral one that's supported in the neighborhood of the origin, then uh, if you look at this, for most lattices, this is going to be zero because most lattices don't have short vectors. And so you get that this, uh, whatever this transformed measure is, it does not have mu too much mass near the origin. And as you shrink the, the neighborhood of your support, of your bump function, uh, you, go, you see that it goes to zero. So you see that the transformed measure gives no atom to the origin. So uh, that's why you don't get any atom, you don't get any delta mass. Okay, so, so now we really have just one number that we would like to understand. Uh, we would like to understand this, uh, well, do we would like to understand? Yeah, we'd like to understand this constant factor. And I'm going to uh, first give you the claim and then, uh, let's see, yeah. So let, let, let me say the following. So, uh, so we're going to have a claim, and then from this claim, we'll see the, uh, okay, so I don't know if I want to number these, maybe I'll say claim one, is that if you take the, sorry, which, way, which way do I want to, sorry, let, let me try to organize them the right way so that we, that we don't have to prove the same thing many times. Uh, No, okay, so let, let, let me uh, say the following, that forget about the claims. So, so f first let, let's look a little bit about at the relationship between the primitive and the reduced Ziegel transforms. So uh, if uh, V is in the lattice, let's say non-zero, then there exists a unique Let's call it L and V prime, where L is, in, is a natural number, and V prime is in the primitive vectors, such that L times V prime is equal to V. So this is just saying that if you have a vector, there's a unique rescaling of this vector that makes it primitive. So if, let's say, V is A1, AD, then L is the GCD, of these numbers, and V prime is just A1 over L, AD over L. Okay, so th this is uh, simple. Uh, th th this is just the definitions essentially, but we have the following exercise that uh, you have the vector, let's call it V0, 1, 0, dot, 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 0, and then you have the group gamma, SLDZ, and the claim is that for any primitive uh, V prime and V inside Z to the D, so for any vector, any primitive vector uh, like this, there exists uh, gamma and gamma such that gamma times V0 is equal to V. So it says that if you have a collection of numbers like this, which are relatively prime, there's a matrix in SLDZ with this as the first column. This is what it's saying, that you can always complete a vector like this with relative prime, relatively prime entries to a D by D matrix such that uh, the determinant is one. So this is uh, your exercise. Uh, okay. 
So this tells you that basically, so these, the, the things, the last two things I wrote here tell you that the lattice is essentially composed of two things, of the primitive vectors and then successive rescalings of the primitive vectors. So, so this means that the lattice delta is the union, sorry, let me call it delta minus zero, is the union over L natural number, L times the primitive vectors minus the zero vector. So it's the union of such rescalings. And so this tells you that uh, the reduced and the primitive Ziegel transforms, there, there's a direct relationship between them. So, uh, so if you denote by m lambda, the operator of just multiplication by lambda, x goes to lambda x, then there's a way to connect these two guys. So the, the, redu the Ziegel transform is just a summation where you apply the primitive Ziegel transform, but then before multiplying it, oops, before, multi before applying the primitive Ziegel transform, you rescale the function so that you sample it on the, lar the larger vectors, a rescaled multiple of the vectors. Okay. So, okay, so this is uh, good. So now we uh, wa want to understand uh, how, how these things, so, the, uh, so, so let, let, let's see how they act on measures. So if you take the transpose, so the redu so it's going to be the sum um, on the t, Right, if you take transposes, you should reverse the order. And so, so what, what do we get? So since if you apply the primitive transform to the Haar measure, you get Lebesgue times some factor A times Lebesgue. And what does multiplication by lambda do to Lebesgue measure? So what, what happens if you multiply by lambda and you apply that to Lebesgue measure? How does it affect it? Does it what? So it multiplies it, but how much? If you multiply, the, uh, if you have a transformation in the plane, you apply multiply everything by lambda. What does it do to Lebesgue? Sorry. Uh, so it's going to be lambda to the power minus d, right? Not, so the question is, is it plus d or minus d? And it's going to be minus d because take a circle of radius, uh, sphere of radius one, you multiply it, you made it larger, and that, that has volume one, so this is smaller. So this is lambda to the minus d uh, times Lebesgue. So this series now tells you that if you apply the reduced transform to a higher measure, then it's the same as applying the primitive transform and then scaling it. So this is just going to be one plus uh, d to the minus, uh, sorry, plus two to the minus d, plus three to the minus d, oops, plus and so on, plus the primitive uh, applied to har which is Lebesgue measure. So we know that this is Lebesgue measure, so you get this, uh, where is it? So you get that, you get exactly this factor which looks exactly like the zeta function, so you get that, it's exactly zeta of d, times the primitive part of, if you apply it to higher measure. So, so now we just have to compute the primitive transform of this higher measure, and uh, then we'll uh, see what, what happens. Okay. 
Okay, so, so, so the, the, there are two claims. Let, let, let me... Uh, let me make the following two claims. So if you take the primitive transform of higher measure, so this is claim one, uh, then the claim is that you get the volume of a lower dimensional quotient times uh, times Lebesgue on Rd. So the claim, yeah, so, so the first claim is that if you just transform the primitive higher measure, you get a lower dimensional volume, which you might hope to know, and then times Lebesgue measure. So this factor is this lower dimensional volume. And the second claim is that if you, so th this is what I should have done in the very beginning. So if you take the, just the full, uh, uh, yeah, so, you take the full transform, so this is including the zero vector, you're gonna get, so the factor that we wanted is the volume of G mod gamma delta zero plus Lebesgue on Rd. And it's also the same as volume of G mod gamma times delta zero plus uh, the, the transform, the reduced transform of Har. Okay, so uh, so w l l l let me uh, uh, try to discuss first claim two, and then sorry, l before actually discussing them, l let me show you that claim one plus two give the following recursive formula. Uh, SL dr mod SL dz, it's data of d times the volume of the lower dimensional one. And so you get the, the promised formula that this is just going to be the product of the zeta functions the product of the zeta values, okay? So wh why is the, the claim one and claim two give you exactly this? It's because, uh, well, we said that the primitive one gives you the previous guy, and then the reduced one is the primitive times the zeta value, and the full transform is just the volume of uh, G mod gamma times this. So you get that the volume of G mod gamma is equal to zeta of D times this. So if you put these three, uh, these formulas together, you get this recursion. Okay, so, so claim two is a little bit easier, so I'll, I'll just m maybe say it in words. So, 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 I, so, the, so, the, so the, the, there are two parts. This was from, uh, okay, so, there are two equalities, so which one am I uh, proving? So this, uh, yes? Sorry, can you say it louder? I can't say it here. Yeah, so, so, so one and two are, uh, so th th these are independent of the normalization of higher measure. Yes. Sorry? This one. No, but, but uh, this is claim two, but there's claim one, which is dependent on the normalization of higher. So claim one, so I, I say, I'm saying that claim two I should have done in the very beginning, and I apologize. As you say, claim two does not depend on the normalization of this. It's, if you, I scale this side by lambda, this scale also scales by the same thing. So claim two is true in general. Claim one is what gives you a normalization. So the content of claim two is just that first these two coefficients are the same, and the first coefficient is the volume of G mod gamma. So le le sorry, le let me clarify claim two again, is that the coefficient 
So of delta naught, and if you just take the higher measure, is the volume of G mod gamma, which is independent of uh, any normalization. Uh, and the other part is that the coefficient of delta naught is equal to the coefficient of Lebesgue for st of har. So it's just these two claims, which are scale invariant. They don't depend on the normalization. So this one, this equality was done using Poisson summation, which I did earlier. This part, so why, why is this so? Well, the, uh, yeah, so, so this, this so, so, so this is, let me call it A. Yeah, so A followed essentially because, so again, you take a small bump function around zero. And if, uh, and if you compute it, you see that uh, the, this function is essentially, because you're using the full summation over the full thing, you're going to get uh, exactly the, uh, that the function is going to be, so you, you test the, you'll, you'll see that it, it should converge to the volume of, so if you call this f epsilon, right? Then, then ba basically this is going to, uh, you, you should, uh, Sorry, and by bump, f epsilon is one at zero and supported in epsilon neighborhood of zero. So then uh, if, if you take this f epsilon and you test it against, so you compute the Ziegel transform, so Ziegel f epsilon is equal to one at most lattices, So then the integral of SF epsilon with respect to har on G mod gamma is approximately the volume of G mod gamma. But at the same time, this should equal the volume of the transform, which is the delta mass, but this is the same as, uh, you know, the f of, f of zero approximately, should be approximately f of zero times the coefficient which we're interested in. Okay, and so this coefficient has to be vo this volume. Okay, now I've been completely honest. Is everybody uh, uh, up to these approximate signs, which you can estimate here? Okay, so uh, the upshot is that we just have to do uh, this computation. So we have to transform the primitive Haar measure. So wh what is it that we have to do? So this, so we need to compute, so for claim one, we need to compute the integral over g mod gamma of the integral of, sorry, of the summation of vectors and primitive vectors f of v this is what we have to compute right we have to take a test function and integrate it on g mod gamma uh, uh, so over all lattices you, and then you start summing over these vectors okay so remember we had this uh, structure so we had uh, so let me call gamma p the stabilizer of one, zero, zero, and gamma, which is SLDZ, and GP to be, again, the stabilizer of the same vector, one, zero, zero, and G, which is SLDR. So you see that these guys are just, so GP is just SL 
d minus 1 r semi direct r to the d minus 1. So these are, so this is matrices of this type. So it's one stuff here, and then a d minus 1 by d minus 1 matrix. Sorry, can people see? Uh, uh, should I write this, that left corner, that corner again, or can. Sorry? Uh, this is, I said uh, earlier, this is by this Poisson summation. So the equality of coefficients is by this symmetry. Okay, so. Right, so we have to, uh, so l l let me know the thought. So in particular, this implies that the primitive vectors, so by the exercise I gave earlier, this is just, uh, let me see on which side I want to do the quotient. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, gamma mod gamma p, right? So they're, they're, they're identified with co this kind of cosets because gamma acts on the lattice and the stabilizer of a primitive vector is gamma p. So we're really summing over this coset. So now uh, let, let's define, so let's observe that G modulo gamma p is equal to the moduli space of, so if, we, if I took the full G mod gamma, then I'm taking a lattice and I'm forgetting the basis. Here we're taking a lattice and we're not forgetting the basis, we're just forgetting the last D minus one vectors and the basis. So this is the moduli space of lattices, delta tilde, with a distinguished uh, vector, primitive vector. So if you like, it's delta tilde and V. With, so it's a lattice, delta tilde, and then you have a distinguished primitive vector in that lattice. Okay? So you can see now that this moduli space is kind of, uh, it's a nice moduli space. G mod gamma P, it maps to Rd minus zero by just a straightforward evaluation, which is uh, if you have this lattice delta tilde V, you just map it to V. And it also maps to the full moduli space, G mod gamma. And so now you notice that the integral that we have over there, so we have this integral over G mod gamma of the summation of F of V, where V belongs to the primitive vectors. This is nothing but the summation is just an integral over a bigger space. It's, you see, the fibers over this point are just the choices of these possible primitive vectors. So instead of taking an integral and then a sum, we can just write it as an integral over this entire space. So it's the integral over g mod gamma p of just f of v d of delta tilde v. Okay. So... So this is, so we really want an int, not just an integral and then a sum, we just have one single integral. So now, uh, but notice that F came from here. F is coming from here, so this F is constant on the fibers of this map. So what are the fibers of the map? So the fibers of G mod gamma P to Rd minus zero are just essentially cosets. So what's Rd minus zero? This is G mod GP, right? So if GP is that SLD minus one R times Rd minus one, then this is, GP is the stabilizer of a point in Rd minus zero. So it's again a homogeneous space under G. So you see you have G mod gamma P mapping to G mod GP. So the fibers are just, uh, should get it on the right side, so hopefully it's something like this. GP module gamma P which is the same as SL D minus one R semi-direct R to the D minus one divided by SL D minus one Z semi-direct Z to the D minus one. 
So you see now that this integral, so, and the other fact is that these measures that we're looking, higher measure here and higher measure here, and here you have Lebesgue measure, then they disintegrate in the right way. If you know, if, with the correct normalizations, they disintegrate in the right way. So you get that the integral over g mod gamma p of f of v is just the integral over rd minus zero of f of v times the volume of this uh, quotient gp mod gamma p, oops, gamma p. But here, so on Rd minus zero, we have the usual Lebesgue measure. Our invariant Lebesgue measure. So now about normalizations, the claim is that you can, if you normalize the measure in the right way on SLD mod, uh, R mod SLDZ, you get normalize Lebesgue measure on Rd minus zero and then normalize Lebesgue measure on the next guy. So it, it's a computation, but there are induced natural measures uh, on the next guy on SLD minus one R. If, if you start with one on the top, there's an, this vibration gives you induced measures. And so, and this, and finally, to, to just end, volume of GP modulo gamma P is just the volume of SL d minus one r mod SL d minus one z because the volume, the normalization is such that the volume of r d minus one module z d minus one is just one. So this group is SL d r semi direct r d SL d minus one r semi direct r d minus one, and then these fibers, these are just story of constant volume, so they don't affect the integration. Okay, so we've proved the, the claim. We've proved this recursion formula. We've expressed the volume, the integral, on this higher dimensional group by kind of lifting it to this guy and then pushing it down and showing that it's related to the previous volume, volume form. Okay, so we're, we're done with uh, Ziegel's formula. So the conclusion is the following. That with the right normalizations, the volume of SL dr mod SL dz is just this product of zeta values. Okay. So now, uh, since I don't have a lot of time, I'll just give two short applications, which are quite nice. And even if you don't care about uh, these numbers, the applications are kind of interesting. So the first application is this. So the first application is, suppose that you have K, uh, a set, reasonable set, set such that for any unimodular lattice, delta, K intersect delta is not empty. So suppose you have a set which intersects any lattice of covolume co one, then the claim is that the volume of K is also at least one. So this is kind of the converse of Minkowski's theorem, which says that you have a convex set that intersects, uh, you have a yeah, convex symmetric set uh, and has sufficient large volume that it will intersect every lattice. This is kind of the converse. It says if you intersect every lattice, then you have to have some volume. And the proof is very simple. You just note uh, the following. So you take the Ziegel transform of the indicator function of k, and this is, at any lattice, by assumption, this is bigger than or equal to 1. And so the integral over g mod gamma of the indicator function of this Ziegel transform uh, is bigger than or equal to the volume of this g mod gamma. So here, the normalization of, of the volume on this G mod gamma doesn't matter. But at the same time, since we know that if you take har, you get the volume of G mod gamma times Lebesgue. This was claim two, which I wrote a little bit confusingly. But 
this claim was independent of the normalization of the volume on G mod gamma. It just says that take har by the full Ziegler transform, uh, sorry, plus delta zero, I guess, but this is not, not so uh, important. Then, so then you find that the integral of 1k over rd minus zero is bigger times the volume of g mod gamma bigger than or equal to the volume of g mod gamma. So if you cancel it, you get the inequality on the volume of k. Okay, other questions? No. So uh, le let me, for the next application, I'll, uh, we'll need just a very sm small strengthening of this. So again, k is, uh, so now it doesn't have to be, uh, it, it's not any set, it's a rate, like, so it's a symmetric respect to zero, symmetric with respect to zero set, uh, and it is radial, where I, I guess sorry, star shaped, meaning that if you have a point, it's uh, it contains all the points in between zero and that point. So it's star shaped just means something. said that if you contain a line, if you contain this point, you contain the entire line. So then suppose that K intersect any primitive, any lattice, except uh, it intersects it in primitive vectors. Then the claim is that the volume of K is bigger than or equal to zeta of n. So, th so th oh, sorry, it's even better, it's two zeta of n. So uh, the, I'll leave, leave the proof as an exercise, but the point of the uh, proof is exactly the same thing here, but now you apply the primitive Ziegel transform, and you know that if a vector, if a symmetric, if a set like this intersects the primitive vectors, it also, uh, so if, it intersect, if, if there's a vector V, then there's also the vector minus V, which gives you the factor of two, and then the zeta of n factor comes from the Ziegel transform factor that you got there, okay? So, so you have this nice uh, lower bound. So what can you do with such a lower bound? Well, one question which people about lattices have, people who study lattices have looked at for a long time is uh, sphere, uh, sphere packings. So how can you find uh, lattices which, with, so we want to find a lattice with long, shortest vector. What, what does this mean? It means that you, for any lattice, you try to, you look at what's the shortest vector in that lattice, and you want that shortest vector to be as long as possible. So you want fat lattices. So in R2, you probably know that the, the hexagonal lattice like this is uh, the best one. This is in R2. And in higher dimensions, not much is known. Okay, so the estimate which you can get, which is nice, is that, so using the, the, this method, is the following. Where is it? Yeah, so let me just take the numbers. So there exists a lattice with shortest vector bigger than or equal to what? To two zeta of, so I apologize, I wrote D there, with N there instead of D. Sigma D, R1 over D. And here, sigma D is the volume of the sphere of radius one centered at zero in RD. So you get this bound, and this is, if you actually work it out, it's roughly a constant times square root of D. So it's not, a, it's not a bad bound. It's definitely bigger than one for D large enough. And, okay, so I don't want to go over time, so I'll just tell you what you do is you take, so set R as the minimum of all radii, or infimum if you like, of all radii such that 
the ball of radius r centered at zero intersects every lattice in a non-zero vector. This is some number, it could be very small, right? This is the number we want, but it could be very small. But if you apply the bound that I just gave here, that the volume of this ball of radius r, since it intersects every lattice, it will in particular intersect in primitive vectors, the volume of that ball is going to be two times zeta of the zeta value, and the volume of the rd, so of B, the ball of radius r around zero, is just sigma d times r to the d. So you get exactly uh, this bound on r. You get that r is at least this much. So you get, uh, yes, yeah, so I get this. I, I won't write explicitly what these zeta values are but, and what the volume is, but the explicit formula is, and this turns out to be roughly square root of d. Square, square, yeah, square root of d, which is not, not a bad bound. All right, so I'll stop here. Thanks for your attention of these four classes.